Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by PropSwap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bets, take your profit, find out how. PropSwap.com. Andrew DeCecco from the Inside the Birds Dot com is here. And we've got observations on day three of Eagles camp. We'll get all his takes from what we've seen so far. A little overview of week number one, day three observations. Andrew DeCecco at a DeCecco NFL here on Football at Four on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Andrew, man, what's going on? Mike, I'm doing great, man. How are you? Awesome, man. F- happy hour. Friday, football's back. I feel like uh, this is a monumental moment in the 2021 year. We got uh, football back finally. And normalcy, right? That's the best part about it. It feels like there's a little bit of normalcy as uh, camp is back and there's battles happening. So let's get into them. Uh, a lot going on there. Uh, first, I want to get Jalen Hurts. The first couple of days of practice here, what we're hearing what you know about Hertz and how he's kind of looked. Because, you know, a lot of people are taking a look at Joe Flacco and saying, man, he looks pretty good out there. But this apparently, you know, this is Jalen Hurts' team. They want him to win this. So what are we hearing about how he's looked so far? Well, Jalen's taken some big steps, that natural progression that you wanted to see from him, throwing the ball in the tight windows, really building that continuity with his receiving core. It's never a question of always with Jalen. And I never get the sense that the moment's going to be too big for him. I think once he gets into the rhythm of things, now he's going to have full off season. He's going to be able to carry that momentum into the preseason. I think you're really going to see him work on work on some of the areas that really held him back last year from from becoming one of the from really putting a stamp on that position, if that makes sense. And now I think he's got an, an array of pass catchers and 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 a healthy offensive line in front of him to sort of help with that transition. So, I mean, just a just a sharp minded. Uh, quarterback who's really starting to blossom really in in year two. Yeah, and the one thing is, uh, you know, they obviously said they want him to take the reins. He's taking everything with the ones, but he's handled it pretty well too. This is a guy obviously who is, uh, you know, unfazed by all the stuff that surrounds him, it seems. Yeah, and that's what you what you really want in a franchise quarterback, right? I mean, you want someone that's going to lead with conviction. You want someone that's not going to – be, let anything distract him. He's always going to be focused on the task at hand, and and that's really what you want. It, it, it's not going to. He's not going to be phased by the Philadelphia crowd, win or lose. And I think that he has the makeup of someone who's who's built for this city, if that makes sense. And I think that he's going to continue to lead this football team and and only get better, especially with the with the innovative coaching staff around him and, and a healthy array of weapons. Yep, I like uh, that answer today, the innovative coaching staff. And we wonder, how are they going to use this? Andrew, uh, obviously Ertz is here. Roseman said he expects him to be here. Uh, Sirianni said, hey, does that mean we have to play more 12? No, we could do this, we could do that, we could go 11, we can make you think. Uh, if Ertz is here, how is he utilized? I think he's more of a steady presence. His availability has rarely been a concern, right? I mean, he's in the, he's someone that can that lives over the middle of the field. He's going to help ease Jalen Hurts into the uh, into the flow of things, so to speak. And I and he's just a sure-handed veteran that runs precise routes and one of the more reliable tight ends in football. So I think he's sort of going to be the less of the the, the less dynamic threat uh, from the tight end spot. But I, I think he's going to have a uh, he's going to be a focal point in this offense. I mean, and when you have two t- two top ten tight ends like the Eagles do, it'd be criminal to not utilize the utilize them to their strength. So I think he's going to be, it, it, you know, as it stands now, he's on the roster, and I, I think if as long as he's on the roster, he's going to be a uh, one of the focal points on offense. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about today, Nick Sirianni? Very vocal during practice, essentially stopping practice at some point, saying details, details, and almost you know. Uh, letting them know that this was not an acceptable practice today. That's what you want to see from a first-year head coach, from really from any head coach. You don't you want to see him sort of take charge and 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 let them know the you know set the standard so to speak. Let them know what's acceptable and and what's not going to cut it. You know, I mean, you have some guys who are vying for roster spots and and depth position there, and you, you just you need to always approach each and every practice with with efficiency and. And, and that resolve to get better. And I think that he's starting to set the precedent early on, which is very important, especially from a young head coach. Like, he's very young. I, I mean, I, I think he really sort of the, 
set the precedent like he's doing is really important. Uh, Andrew, uh, I want to get your take on the second running back job. You and Jeff Mosher uh, basically said, are you Team Howard or are you Team Carrion Johnson? Right now, um, as Adam Kaplan talked about on the Inside the Birds podcast, is Howard looks like he's in shape, uh, looks, dare I say, explosive. So Howard Johnson, uh, there was a former baseball player, Howard Johnson. There you uh, go. How does uh, that battle look right now? Well, I think it's one of those things, one of the uh, premier battles this summer, along with left tackle, of course. But I think when you look at the running back spot and you see what both players bring to the table, the absence of a power running game was clearly evident on offense last season, and it really eliminated a crucial dimension for that offense, especially with Jalen Hurst being a young quarterback and sort of thrown into the fire. And now I think that you could even you could even see them keep both of those guys and use Kenneth Gainwell as sort of the change of guy and maybe say goodbye to Boston Scott. I mean, they have a lot of options, but what I think that they both bring is they're tremendous pass blockers. They're good between the tackles. They can grind out the, uh, those tough yards, but I think they carry on Johnson is actually the best receiving back out of all the backs that are in the stable right now. So I really do believe that if he's healthy and, and, and has that and can sort of show some semblance of a burst that he used to have, I know he's just 24 years old, but those injuries – they tend to take a toll, especially when they're knee injuries. I think that he brings the most uh, most dimensions to the to the offense, and, and would be a good compliment to Miles Sanders. Good stuff, uh, Andrew. Obviously, and then uh, Boston Scott, and we know uh, the rookie Kenneth Gainwell. They're in the mix too. But if Howard uh, gives him that second, you know that you know that power back, uh, he might you know um, kind of take some of the touches away from those guys, or are they use totally different. Well, it's interesting, right? Because when you look at how Nick Sirianni, where he's coming from, and how Frank Reich deployed the running backs and with the Colts, you saw Jonathan Taylor handle the, the lion's share of the carries and be the early down runner, but you also saw Naheem Hines sprinkling in there and a number of other guys. So I think that these guys are going to have clear-cut roles. I don't know that they're going to lean on Miles Sanders to be a three-down workhorse. I also don't know if Miles Sanders is, frankly, if he's that kind of player uh, two two years in. I think we've, we've sort of seen that he – it kind of might be best utilized to preserve his explosiveness and, 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 and some of his dynamic traits to sort of use him sparingly. I still think that he was criminally misutilized last season. He does need at least 15 touches a game, but I do think that they have a guy, a lot of guys behind him that present uh, a lot of different matchup, uh, matchup problems for teams. I think that they have guys that can grind out the clock and carry on Johnson and Jordan Howard. I also think that they have guys like Kenneth Gainwell that can be mismatched uh, mismatches, uh, and they also have guys like Jason Huntley, who we're going to see a more extensive look at this summer. Remember, he was acquired off waivers prior to last season, and so we never really got to see, and he had only a handful of carries, and then Boston Scott's there as well. So they do have a number of different guys that can fill uh, a myriad of roles. Uh, over at uh, the left guard position, Isaac Sayamala is uh, injured week to week here, which uh, has Nate Herbig in that spot. Landon Dickerson obviously not ready to go. Brandon Brooks missing some time with the injuries already. So already some problems on the offensive line. But let me ask you, if Sayamala was not able to start the season, is Herbig your guy at left guard, or do you hope that Landon Dickerson is ready and he's the guy there? Well, I think – you hope that say Malu's ready early on. Maybe it might just be a week or two that he sort of uh, is slow to get you know reacclimated. But I think in the perfect world, you have Nate Herbig and you plug him in there. Nate Herbig's such a valuable player, and he's sort of overlooked, been overlooked this off season. But he's got extensive experience last year in a number of roles, and he's done and he got progressively better as the season went on. And I think that he has so much value as a key backup that you just let him leave him in there and don't rush Landon Dickerson in um, prematurely. Let him sort of get his uh, get his sea legs under him. Let him in a, in a I mean in, in an ideal situation the Eagles would not like they probably wouldn't want Landon Dickerson to play a single snap this year and come in next year completely free with a clean bill of health and sort of dominate and he'll be, he have his full off season in an NFL weight uh, weight room and, and everything else so. I think you, you plug Nate Herbig in there and don't rush Landon Dickerson into the lineup if you don't have to because Nate Herbig's shown that he can be an adequate starter uh, if pressed into duty. I know uh, you do a lot of homework on the draft. Milton Williams was a third-round pick. Uh, yesterday, Jonathan Gannon said he could play five positions. They plan on moving him all over the place. So hearing that, your impressions of what Milton Williams could bring to the team this season. 
Yeah, I'm not really surprised to hear that, and that's part of the reason why I was so enamored with the pick when when it was when the pick was in. A lot of uh, um, many people may not have been as enticed with, with the selection coming from Louisiana Tech, and and with, there are certain players like uh, like Dami Brown on the board, the wide receiver from North Carolina, and so on and so forth. But he just brings a the, the positional versatility. I think he has a lot of ability that can sort of be unearthed this summer. I think he's he, he came into the to the NFL uh, a bit raw, but I think working with him this summer with Tracy, Tracy Rocker and, and, and some of the coaches there are really going to uh, accent what he's good at and, and put him in position to be successful, whether it be defensive end or whether it be uh, defensive tackle or, or whatever plans that they may have for him. I think that he is a player that can come right in and, and play and give them some productive snaps and be disruptive in a, you know, in a, in a limited capacity early on. Yeah. They indicated too, Andrew, that Fletcher Cox might be doing a lot of moving around the, the line too. Like don't just get fixated on him playing, you know, uh, at the defensive tackle spot. Yeah. I mean, Fletcher Cox is another player that I mean, you can argue and, and me and Jeff did in our, in our, in what we wrote, <laughs> I, I picked him as, you know, the best, the best player on, on the defense. So, I mean, and, and arguably, and I think I actually put him as the best player on the team, and you can certainly make a case for that as well. Because of the mismatches he, pre- he presents, and moving him around to defensive end, whether it be defensive end, defensive tackle, wherever, you have to account for him. And whether or not he gets to the quarterback or not, he's still going impact, to uh, impact the play. He's going to command a double team and open things up for other people to, to you know, to, find, to, to flow to the football. So uh, he just such, is such a valuable player that, Wherever you move him around, teams are going to have to account for him, and it's going to open things up for, for his teammates. Yeah, I'm interested to see how Jonathan Gannon utilized that. I want to get your take, Andrew, because obviously uh, Stephen Nelson is now here. You heard what Gannon said about him. Is Hey, uh, first impressions are this guy's pretty good. Uh, how does that change the expectations for this Eagles defense? Well, that, that's interesting because – Teams won't be able to prey on the other side, whether it was Avante Maddox, Michael Jaquette, Kevon Seymour. Now they have to. It's, it's sort of adding a guy like Stephen Nelson, Steve Nelson, as he likes to be called. It, it's going to keep offenses honest, and you're going to have to find ways. I think they're going to find success over the over the middle of the field. To be honest with you, I still am not completely. Uh, entranced with the linebacker situation by any means, and and I think that teams will find success there. But I think the se- secondary now is much more balanced. You're moving a guy like Avante Maddox into the slot where he really belongs. He can also play some safety and be that positionless type defender, which I think he is best suited for. And so the secondary has a is a is very veteran laden, and I think that. Um, but the one question that I have about the secondary, Mike, is now there's still depth concerns, right? I mean, Definitely. should there be an injury to either of those, any of those positions, then what? Then you're in a similar situation that you were in last year. A lot of these guys are just a play away. They don't really have, they're, they're really razor thin there. But I mean, as far as stars are concerned, you have to like what they did. Yeah, no question. Like if Nelson, Slay, and Maddox are out there without putting you on the spot here and knowing everybody's depth chart, but starting corners, those three, where would that rank them in the division? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I would probably say two. You like the Giants better, I would imagine, or do you like Washington's better? I, I like the Giants. Can't better. be Dallas's, right? Yeah, I like I like the Giants better. <laughs> Bradbury, uh, you like Bradbury? I guess is the best. You think Bradbury better than Slay? Yes, I do. All right, and Dory Jackson, who's been. You know, I, we were talking about this the other day. I said, ah, you got to put them right. Like, if you like Bradbury better than Slay, then you probably like the Giants a little better. But Adoree Jackson, he's kind of been banged up. We'll see what he brings to the table. I don't know. But I, the fact, though, they went from definitively the worst to in the conversation. That's how interesting that signing became. And you mentioned it, though. I think it's a great point is you got Anthony Harris, Rodney McLeod, both veterans, these two veterans. I mean, this is all of a sudden a veteran, but one injury brings you right back to square one. Yeah, and, and that's the problem because then all of a sudden you ha- you're looking at someone like a Craig James or or in that safety spot, Kevon Wallace, who, who's very inexperienced, or um, Elijah Riley, what maybe. You, Marcus, what are you about? Epps. What are you hearing about Wallace? Uh, uh, because it appears that you know he said the other day, man, the, the, everything is slowing down for me. Like it sounds like one of those classic, hey. The game's a lot different all of a sudden for me in year number two. Was he a guy that you liked out of the draft last year and and have interesting expectations for for this year? Well, 
as as far as the the, the second part of your question, I, I liked him coming out of the draft, but I didn't necessarily see him as a bona fide starting caliber safety. I saw him as a rotational complementary piece on defense, someone that can be that third safety and really give them quality snaps, especially if they suffer injuries. I think he could step in and adequately fill in. But as far as being a full-time safety, I don't know that he's that player. Now he's, things are starting to slow down. Like you said, he's starting to settle in. And I think he's going to carve out a role there, which is going to be very important when you look at you, you look at uh, Anthony Harris and then you look at Roger McLeod, who plans to play week one. But then there's also Marcus Epps there. We've seen Marcus Epps. I don't know that the Eagles would like Marcus Epps out there for an extended period of time. So you really need to see Kayvon Wallace take that next step. I also think that Elijah Riley is a young player who has some promise there. He's a player that we talked about last summer. He has cornerback and safety uh, versatility there. So uh, there's unproven depth behind the two starters, but I think that it's uh, there's some players there that can give them quality steps uh, for a limited, in, a, in a limited capacity. Give me your take on the Josh Sweat, Derek Barnett uh, defensive end battle there because – I don't think we thought that was going to be so much. This is almost like the left tackle spot. You got these two guys, I think, battling for starting uh, snaps. Yeah, I, I certainly didn't didn't envision that being a, a an actual competition going into training camp. But you know, here we are. That's kind of the, the that's really the mantra that Nick Sirianni's preached since he's got here is, is competition, competition, competition. So, uh, looking at that battle. I still think Derek Barnett has the edge there, but I think that you also heard Nick Sirianni say how he's going to implement a, a rotation. So you're going to see a lot of guys get a lot of more, a lot more snaps than we've grown accustomed to seeing in the previous regime. Ryan Kerrigan is going to see his snaps. Milton Williams could also play some defensive end. Um, you, you, uh, they have Teron Jackson, who, who's going to see some extended look this summer in the preseason. Um, I think Josh Sweat's a player who's probably best utilized in a rotational role to, to sort of bottle up his explosiveness and, and, and dynamic presence off the edge. A lot of those players sort of lose their burst, so to speak, when they're, when they're put out there for 50-plus snaps a game. They don't necessarily have the same impact that they would when they're coming in, um, coming in fresh with, fre- with fresh legs. So I, I think that Derek Winnett will probably get the early downs. That's uh, another interesting storyline. There's so much going on here. Uh, it's fun to have baseball back, or excuse me, football back. It's fun to see the training camp battles, and obviously some stories are already emerging. Devonta Smith, though, he said it himself that he didn't have a great day. He said, I talked to Slay, talked to everybody. I want all their information. And then apparently today had a very good day. We all anticipate uh, big things from Smith, but uh, mm-hmm. these first couple days, it sounds as if um, he's acclimating himself well to the NFL, but... On the other side, are you concerned about Jalen Rieger and the slow start he's had with some injuries? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard not to. I mean, Jalen's dealing with some some things off the field as well, which I think we all need to be cognizant of and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, just sensitive of when, when we're evaluating them because a lot of these things, like I said, everyone is wired differently in the NFL. And some people can block it out, but others it will actually, you know, those type of things will impact impact the way that you you know approach each practice and things like that but yeah i mean couple coming off the if, if look if he had a a strong rookie season or offered glimpses of the player that the eagles envisioned him being the that explosive dynamic uh, dynamic wide receiver that could move around and, and create mismatches i don't think that there would be as much of a concern but the fact that now you're compiling uh this compiled with with what is sort of taking place now I mean, it's going to be it's going to send off alarms a little bit, I would think. I mean, you really want to see him take that next step, and he's going to have to get in the get into the rhythm of things fairly early here, or he can fall behind because there's there's other guys there now and other young players that are, that are going to be vying for snaps as well. So, you know, we'll see how that goes, but it's you know it's kind of touch and go right now. Uh, football four, Andrew DeCheco at a DeCheco NFL Eagles training camp day three. More inside the birds. Uh, podcast comes out on Monday. They'll have all the weekend edition. Andrew, of course, and the boys do a great job over there. Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan, Andrew DeCecco, all a part of football at four. Eagles are back. They open the preseason on August the 12th, and you can hear that game live on 97.3 ESPN. Andrew, enjoy the weekend, my man. You too, my friend.